Okay, so this is, welcome to Porkfest 10, and this is our Bitcoin panel. This is one of two panels, and this uh, current forum, forum that you're attending will be about the future of Bitcoin, and we might talk a little bit about alternate currencies in general. I'm here with my very distinguished panel, or somewhat distinguished panel, depending on your viewpoint, but uh, over there to the left, we, to your right, we have Ron Helwig, and uh, he moved in 2005 and had lived in eight different towns, right? And yeah, and he's created Shire Silver as an alternative currency, uh, took, one, took one year to accept Bitcoin as a legitimate currency and now accepts it for Shire Silver. He has been experimenting with the Bitcoin investment world. And uh, the next person, Josh Harvey, he's, he's a co-founder of Lamasu, uh, which is a Bitcoin uh, capital or your company, right? And then the one thing that I think is very exciting is they're developing a, a Bitcoin machine that allows you to take Federal Reserve notes and get Bitcoins without any interaction from a person. So it's, it's supposed to bring the, uh, the very lot of convenience to buying Bitcoins, which is one of the main hurdles uh, in the current environment. And then if we keep on going, there's Teresa here. And Teresa is co-founder and treasurer for Free Aid. Now you probably have seen their tent up there. And they're an organization of medically skilled liberty lovers created to help individuals organize projects that educate people about the value of mutual aid. And I, for one, can be a testament to how valuable the service they provide uh, at Porkfest is uh, if you have some kind of issue, they, they, they might have, there might be an EMT on the spot. Like I've seen it pretty much instantaneously here at Porkfest and it's because of Teresa and her establishment. Well, her, her, Teresa and her team establishing free aid. And uh, also, we also have Jaffet Stevens who runs the browser game mindthings.com which began accept, accepting Bitcoins two years ago. I think it's been more than two. A little more. Uh, he wrote most of the BitPay plugins, which integrate online merchants with Bitcoin. He's convinced several merchants to, in his area to accept Bitcoin. So we have a great panel today. I, I for one, know Jaffet was uh, one of the f first adopters. He, uh, this game that you can play online, you can buy little um, virtual goods in the game that helps you get better with Bitcoin. So. He, he's probably one of the initial people that gave Bitcoin some value, um, um, among others, not, not, not exclusively. Okay, so the way uh, this is set up is we're, we're going to have about 40 minutes of a moderated discussion, and then uh, there will be questions from the audience. Now, if you want to be recognized earlier, that's fine. Um, I'll do my best to take your questions as they come. Um, let's start off with Ron, since we introduced in this order. So Ron, I had a question for Ron, and I wanted to ask Ron what, the, uh, what he imagines the, that uh, alternate currencies would, um, could, what could be the consequences and potential of alternate currencies for the, for the globe and the earth? Yeah, well, uh, I think one of the primary things that, that I'm looking at with uh, the currency choices that we're getting now is that the whole world is essentially used to inflationary currency systems and and there's all the misallocation of resources and all the uh, the malinvestment going on because of the inflationary currencies and looking at uh, you know my my currency the the bullion based currencies uh, are are mostly stable in price and then Bitcoin which is deflationary in its characteristics or, or can be um, is kind of the opposite swing of that pendulum so looking into the future as as these alternative currencies come on board we're gonna be moving away from the inflationary currency systems to a deflationary system and I'm I'm still thinking about what does that going to mean for, you know, how is the world going to operate? How are economics going to change in the future? And I, and I you know, would ask all of you to consider that as well. Um, what are the investment opportunities that are going to come up? How is that going to change your business? 
uh, how is that going to change if, if you're just a worker? How is that going to change things for you? Um, well, good. Well, thank you very much, Ron. And uh, Josh, he's kind of our technical expert on the stage. And um, I, I had a question of a technical nature for you, for you Josh. Um, so the question is, how will Bitcoin scale to service a growing user base? And also, I want you to address the, the blockchain specifically, it, which is getting quite large. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things about Bitcoin is uh, it was basically created by one person, um, or at least we think it's one person. We don't really know who he is, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he had to make a lot of choices in, in the very beginning. So um, he determined how often the transactions would be processed, how often these uh, blocks would come out. Now they're every 10 minutes. How many Bitcoins would be created each block. He made all of these um, little technical decisions and, and variables, and they've actually stood up incredibly well over the test of time. Um, one of those is the, the, the block, maximum block size, which determines how many, the, what the rate of transactions can be um, for any given period of time. So right now, um, I think the maximum is about seven transactions a second. Um, and of course, there are um, transaction processing systems out there like Visa and MasterCard that do considerably more than that. Um, the question is, how does Bitcoin scale um, if it starts being adopted on a much, much wider basis? And how do we have to change the ideas that Satoshi had? And I think it's, it's just something that's important for the, the community to discuss. It's an open source project, um, and there are all kinds of different um, people from technical backgrounds, from philosophical, economical uh, backgrounds, and they're just hashing that out right now. Um, the trade-off is between having the block size so big that the average person can't store it and process it on their computer, and then it becomes a little bit more centralized. And on the other hand, you want to be able to process a lot of very small transactions globally. So those, those are exactly the kinds of issues that Bitcoin is going to face as it becomes more and more popular. And uh, I think it's just a kind of a natural part of the growing up process of Bitcoin. If I could uh, interject on that question, yes. one of the unique things about Bitcoin is the way these things are decided. There is no like one person or one group deciding this, uh, even though it's, it can appear that way. Uh, what we have yet to see is a protocol change, like a, a massive protocol change, which, which, in some, which some people would say is required uh, to address this growing problem of this limit of seven transactions per second. And so it's going to be uh, also a test of how this, the centralized system is going to decide how that protocol will change. And it, needs, and it probably needs to change. Yes, yes. So that's a concern for Bitcoin users, but um, I know there's smart people thinking about it, and there's, there's solutions that might come. Um, but I had another question for Teresa here, and uh, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of an intro for it. I've been reading great things about how Teresa is going to or is implementing Bitcoin into her. Uh, I want to say business, but it's a you know it's a volunteer effort, and they they run on donations. Um, so how t will Bitcoin affect your organization, Free Aid? Uh, well. Uh like Darren said, uh, Free Aid uh, has been operating on Bitcoin. Uh, we've been operating on Bitcoin since uh, April 15th. We made the announcement this year um, on purpose on tax day, <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, but we actually had been accepting Bitcoin donations since uh, late uh, 2011. And we got several donations last year here at Porkfest, which have done very well for us, <laughs> which we really appreciate it. And uh, we, we've had a, some great support from a lot of people that were encouraging us to use Bitcoin early. So I can tell you already, it's already changed our business quite a bit uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, we've I, I believe we've received a lot more donations by having accepted Bitcoin since early stages. And then uh, the other way it's changed us so far is that we have been better able to focus on our real mission, uh, which is, uh, like Darren said, helping educate educate people about the value of mutual aid and our main activity to do that is at events here like at Porkfest where we support uh, medically skilled volunteers who cho choose to offer first aid services and I'm also doing a CPR workshop uh, tomorrow, Friday and Saturday 
uh, to uh, you know free to anyone that wants to brush up their CPR skills and help potentially save another person from cardiac arrest. So we've been better able to focus on those things rather than uh, following through with all kinds of state paperwork and um, business that was very distracting to us uh, when we were much more embedded in the legacy banking system and all their connections to governments. Thank you very much, Teresa. I believe this question is also relevant for Jaffet, um, who was such an early adopter of Bitcoin. Sure, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. I, uh, my browser game that Darren mentioned, at first it only accepted PayPal. It was really the only option at the time that would made any sense. But as soon as I heard about Bitcoin, I said, yeah, that's going in there too. Um, the, the way that Bitcoin has changed my business model is that not, now it's not a problem of finding PayPal users as an advertiser, because I'm the advertiser as well. I can now direct my marketing at Bitcoin users, and that can be anybody in the world. And that, that just opens up a whole new, um, a whole new market for me that I didn't have access to. There are advertisers now, well, they're advertising companies, I should say, or um, content, well, I don't know what, how to call them, advertising middlemen that now deal exclusively in Bitcoin. So you can pay Bitcoin to acquire um, traffic at your website, and those people are going to already be kind of you know, clued into what Bitcoin is, and probably they'll have Bitcoin to spend. Uh, so I like, I like that, uh, the, the ability to um, spend the Bitcoins that I'm earning to uh, grow the business even further. Great. Do you, are you able to use Bitcoin for hosting and things like that? Or? I, I actually could. I haven't switched, made that switch yet. But yeah, there are hosting companies now that, yeah, um, that will, that will uh, provide oh. cert, um, internet servers. Yeah, you're almost yeah. ready to close that loop, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's Wonderful. the next step. So that's a real Bitcoin economy right there. Small one. Um, I, do, I have a question for Josh. I have, uh, there's a, a comment here about forks. Uh, so what can happen with Bitcoin using it is uh, there's uh, this blockchain that we mentioned earlier that it get basically records every transaction that ever happens. So as more transactions happen, there's more to record, and that takes more s data, more um, bytes to save. And um, that blockchain serves the purpose of basically coming to a consensus, saying what if a transaction gets recorded, then that transaction basically is agreed on upon by everybody that it was a real one, more or less, not quite. But the thing is, it's consensus. There's a possibility with the way uh, programming set up and things like that, that uh, there could be kind of disagreement about what transactions are valid or not. And that's what's called a fork. You basically would have one type of blockchain and another type of blockchain. So I want to ask a question to Josh about a fork and specifically um, address maybe the accidental fork that happened, I believe, last year. Um, what would be the li mo li most likely scenario for a accidental fork? Um, I mean, we've only had one observation of that in history, but what could be other consequences or results? Yeah, well, nobody was really saw that coming, so um, I think that's probably the best example of what could happen. Um, that was a few months ago, and um, what happened was there was a new software release of the official Bitcoin client, and that Bitcoin client um, s changed subtly how um, which transactions were considered valid on the network and which ones were considered invalid, whereas older versions would consider other transactions valid. So there was a dif disagreement between computers running um, one client and computers running the other client, and then you had a kind of race between these two clients, um, and you had two blockchains that were being built. And some people were looking at, um, blockchain is basically the ledger of Bitcoin. So there were some people looking at one ledger, and a bunch of other people uh, running the other client were looking at a, a different ledger. So, of course, that caused a lot of problems. People were seeing two different ledgers for the same system. Um, that was one thing that was amazing is that was handled very, very quickly. Within a matter of hours, um, the Bitcoin community in general was on it. All the m major players um, just came online, talked to each other, resolved it. And within a matter of a few hours, um, they came to a solution. Not everybody completely agreed, but everybody got on board with it. And, and it was completely resolved so that we were back to one ledger. Um, that thing just shows how complex the system is. And even though 
um, dozens of the most talented Bitcoin uh, coders were looking over this new software, went out anyway with this bug that caused this serious problem. Yeah, and the so, bug was actually an 07 right. something. It yeah. was an 07. It was and fixed in 08. Prior. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't realize that the fixing of that bug would cause uh, these issues. So um, uh, it's a very, very complex system. It needs a, a tremendous amount of testing. And I think it's kind of a cautionary tale, but at the same time, it's it kind of shows how resilient this uh, this open source community an open source project is where it was so quickly uh, um, resolved, not even by official people, but just by the community coming together. Um, Gavin Andreessen, who's kind of the lead developer, he does have a kind of official capacity. Uh, he, I think, was the one who proposed the solution, but everybody had to get on board. He couldn't just dictate that right. from above. So uh, that, that's, that's what I think we can learn from it. And you don't know what's going to happen. There will be other issues, other crises that will yeah. happen in the future, and we have to rely on this resilient uh, distributed network yeah. to, to deal with it in real yeah. time. I, I know that I was concerned about a transaction that occurred during that fork, and I, yep. I went through manually and, and found that it had confirmed on both branches of the, yeah, of I the remember. fork. So um, either way, no matter which branch wins, that transaction would be confirmed. And so, there were some so people who lost some money, and I think uh, yes. they were reimbursed by the uh, Bitcoin faucet. Well, yeah, and, it, and they, were just, they just lost income, didn't right, they? Right, the it, miners yeah. who were mining the wrong branch, so the, the wrong blockchain, the wrong ledger that later on became um, basically invalid, um, they were reimbursed by, by the Bitcoin faucet. Okay, very good, very good. And so I have a question here that Teresa pops into mind. Um, how are governments likely to respond to issues of taxation and regulation? I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this, I don't this, know actually. either, but I think that's a relevant question well, for, for you. Uh, well, I'm not really sure how they're going to respond. Uh, I think that uh, I saw something just the other day that said the IRS is so busy dealing with its Tea Party scandal. I don't know if you heard, but they, you know, disproportionately went after groups for political reasons to hold up their nonprofit applications. And we at Free Aid thought that we might have fallen into that category too, which is probably why we ran into so many tr troubles with trying to pursue our nonprofit status with them. Uh, but. Uh, but they said that they're so busy dealing with all of these scandals that um, they're not going to have time to come up with new, IRS isn't going to have time to come up with new Bitcoin specific guidance. So they're instead pushing their standard bartering stuff and who knows what else. Um, but uh, apparently they have their hands full. But I, I'd like to think that uh, in time as Bitcoin takes off and maybe other alternative currencies and whatever else, the more people that ignore the governments of the world. Um, I think the I think the more that they'll have too much on their hands to to deal with it. They I don't think they're gonna figure it out. And I'd like to think they'll implode of their own weight from people getting sick of using their over <laughs> overburdened systems that are um, stealing from us. Oh, great, great. And I think this is a relevant question. And I would like to. Um, ask all any other panel member if they would have uh, any comments on taxation and regulation when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, Ron? Sure. Uh, you know, it, the, the general suggestion that I would give is that you just treat it like it's a, a foreign currency if you accept, you know, say Canadian dollars or, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to play their game, if you're going to, if you're going to be in the system and trying to not get audited and, and if you're worried about that, you just treat it like people are paying with euros or with whatever. You just do the same kind of accounting, and and you should be covered. That should be something that they will find acceptable. You know, for me, no, I haven't paid taxes since 2006, and I've been saying that openly, and uh, you know, and pff, nothing's happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You heard it here, not first. Okay, so <laughs> Jaffid, Jaffid. Um, how are central bankers likely to respond to this competition that Bitcoin provides? Uh, you know, I think that relates a lot to the first question, uh, which is how is the IRS going to respond? Uh, I think oh, I think a lot of what the IRS response would be might might actually stem, might actually have its root in how the central bankers view this, uh, because we all I think we most of us know who's really in charge of this country and the world. 
uh, I, obviously they see it as a threat. I don't think they've decided how they're going to react to this, but central bankers of the world are now are, have, a, have a new competition. And um, we saw how the IRS can be abused to target specific groups, and that's, that's no longer a crazy conspiracy theory anymore. It's, not, it's, you know, it's out in the open. Um, I, I, I certainly do see that as an attack vector to, to tell the IRS or to, you know, influence the IRS in some way to say, look, you got, you know, anybody who's, any business who's accepting Bitcoin, audit them. Any business, any or any, especially the uh, the uh, uh, exchanges. Uh, so I see that as one of the attack vectors. Uh, and the other, I guess, the other response possibly from them that um, that they might consider is that as Bitcoin grows, it's going to require uh, more and more resources to maintain. There's this question of how how bigger how big are we going to allow these uh, blocks to get? How many transactions per second are we going to um, accommodate and as as that grows as the transactions per second grows there's it's, it's going to be less and less possible for individual users to run a, a, a client a full blockchain like the whole the whole shebang and so that's going to be that we're going to see that uh, moved into the hands of uh, centralized uh, companies who are of course a lot easier to target as as the uh, as they have done with other companies and so the attack vector then for the central bank would be, well, now we have, you know, a, a easier, well, not easier, but I guess I could say fewer targets to think about, if that makes sense. That's, uh, it's, it's, it, 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 and there are, you know, multiple ways that they can attack it from there, regulation, uh, audit, like I said, with the IRS, um, or just outright, um, well, I was going to say outright ban it, but I mean, obviously, there's uh, there's 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 been some, uh, well, there has been some um, uh, talk about, well, you know, you can't really ban Bitcoin, but they could, in theory, go after these uh, more centralized exchanges. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to say something about that. I think um, the these regulatory bodies um, bodies aren't monolithic institutions, and there there are a lot of different people in them. And I think you see some of them are putting out reports on virtual currencies or Bitcoin specifically. And you can see in those reports that some of the people there are kind of interested in Bitcoin and think it's pretty cool. And then you have the other guys who just want to like quash it. So I think inside of these institutions, there's a whole spectrum of people. And some of them, I think, are pretty intrigued by it. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think the CIA is going to realize that it's really useful for their guns and drug smuggling that they're doing, and so they're going to they're going to want it to stay around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something something like something like Tor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, I, I, there's a related question here. So, uh, why don't I bring it up and uh, if please jump in, anybody from the panel. How will a borderless currency affect the way businesses operate? Anybody want to take that? I can take it. Okay, Teresa, please. Yeah, well, this is one of the most exciting things about Bitcoin. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know, four or five months ago or so that I heard about Iranians that were having problems with hyperinflation in their country. And as you probably know, they have a lot of sanctions on them so that regular people in that country are not able to... Uh, withstand the effects of inflation. They're not allowed to buy euros. They're not allowed to buy dollars. Uh, I, in my day job, I'm not allowed to do any business with Iran whatsoever, and um, and that's uh, all imposed by these sanctions by the U.S. government. And uh, so I was really excited to hear that a lot of them are now turning to Bitcoin as a way to shield themselves from the effects of hyperinflation from their own government, as well as all these sanctions from other governments. And that was just really inspiring to me. And I started paying more attention to Bitcoin after that. Like I said, we've been accepting Bitcoin donations for a long time, but after I realized how uh, truly liberating that is to have people all over the world trading with each other without having to worry about fees or sanctions or other kinds of doing business with governments unwillingly, uh, I got really excited and started looking into Bitcoin more, and then we integrated it more into our operations at Free Aid, and I started using it personally as well, finally, by then. 
Yeah, I wasn't that, I'm not that familiar with the Iranian currency, but I, I'm currently aware that also Argentina is going through significant inflation again, and Venezuela as well. I mean, they've just instituted price controls in Venezuela. So this is a very common theme in the world. So that's, that's a great answer. So Jeff, Jeff? I, the other uh, benefit is uh, that there's currently the, this big financial structure that is taking, skimming off the top of every transaction, uh, especially the ones that go from one country to another. Uh, that's, that I see is, uh, I mean, obviously that we don't know what the transaction fees are going to be in the future, but right for right now, anyway, there's this huge opportunity for businesses to save a bundle of money on any imports or exports that they may have. Um, it's like, I don't know any, anywhere between three and 5%, uh, and more and more if you go to certain other countries, I, I've noticed that with my own company as well, the, just the, the ability to. Uh, receive money from anywhere in the world, whereas if they went through PayPal, they're paying not only the three percent that PayPal takes, but even more on top of that for the exchange. And so that that's something that's going to be totally as you know just as seamless as me paying you in the same room. Yeah, that that's amazing. Um, I have another question uh, that deals with Bitcoin mining. Uh, so mining is a process where that blockchain is built that confirms the transactions and keeps a consistent ledger among everybody. When a block is mined, there's new Bitcoins issued to whoever basically solves some math problem. There's a, it's, a, it's a difficult math problem that you basically just have to keep trying over and over and over. And it's based on a, a certain type of function that's very difficult. It's called the SHA-256 function. And uh, so uh, that's what the current uh, current mining process uses. There is some discussion, I don't know how significant it, significant it is, but there is some discussion about switching that over at some point, which would be significant, especially to people who have already invested uh, money in certain types of chips that do this SHA-256 over and over. So I, I wanted to ask Josh, does he think that uh, the Bitcoin mining will change any time, like let's say in the next 10 years? Uh, well, 10 years is a really long time uh, yep. in the Bitcoin world, so I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, looking out that well, far. What, two years? Yeah, uh, I doubt that it will change in, in the next two years, actually. Um, and I, I actually personally see the, the whole ASIC revolution as a good thing. Um, so basically, uh, Bitcoin mining it started off where you could just mine them on your laptop in the very early days, and you could just uh, get Bitcoins that way just by running your laptop. Um, but as the network grows and as more people start mining, the uh, difficulty adjusts, so it becomes harder and harder to mine that on your laptop. Then you have to go to beefier computers. Then people figured out how to mine on their graphic cards. And then you had to have these uh, big setups of graphics cards. Then they had a, another uh, technology along the way. And finally, where we're at now is uh, with uh, ASIC te technology, which are custom-built computer chips just for Bitcoin mining. And they're incredibly more efficient than anything that came before. Um, but the nice thing about ASICs is it's, there's no next like, huge step um, that can happen. So it's going to be a much more stable environment for mining. And it's just going to grow at a fairly uh, controlled pace. Which means that um, I think this could get very distributed, which was the original idea of everybody being able to participate in the mining of Bitcoins. Already today, you can buy a little USB, something that looks like a USB drive, plug it into your computer, and you'll be mining um, uh, to a significant amount. It's not, uh, it's probably not even, you're not going to be making money necessarily, but you'll be able to be participating in, in the mining um, ecosystem. And I think in the future, these chips are going to be so cheap that they'll, they can just start building them into routers. You can start building them into computers, into flash drives, and it'll just be your computer or maybe even your smartphone could have these chips built in so it'll be a massively distributed mining operation and that that would be a really great place to be great would that would the power costs ever be an issue if you start building building these into other types of well the, devices? the asics are are much more uh, energy efficient than than the technologies that came before um, so that's not really a significant cost the significant cost is the capital costs of developing and manufacturing the initial production run of the ASICs. Once you start the production run, 
you can just knock them out pretty cheaply. Oh, wow. Okay, so I have a question I'd like to pose to this side, to my right, your left. Um, basically about Bitcoin technology. How do you think Bitcoin technology will affect the world? And the, that's a two-pronged question, honestly. Like you could think about the, the, the current protocol that people are going to be using. And then you could also think about what, uh, what types of things using similar ideas could be built. So um, think, please. I'll take that one first. Um, from my perspective, the technologies that excite me the most are the ones that are facilitating anonymous or um, without government, you know, peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And so I, the way I see that changing the world is absolutely cutting out these really high-cost overburdened uh, systems that governments use mostly, but also other big corporations and people I don't like to do business with. So I get really excited when I find a new technology or a new website service or something that does something to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer transactions, um, cross, uh, across the world transactions, you know, anything that makes it easier for us. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I'm most excited about is uh, Lamassu's Bitcoin machine, for example, um, you know, that where Josh works and, and Zach and, and also Matt Whitlock, who, um, uh, who does some consulting for free aid about Bitcoin. So uh, basically, uh, you know, anything like that where you can put in cash anonymously and send it to any Bitcoin address anywhere is really exciting. And um, my friend Mike Gogolsky has a BitcoinLaundry.org also, which is also very cool. Um, he unfortunately can't be here, but he's here in spirit for sure. Um, and, uh, and then I, I just heard, I hear about all kinds of things every day. Like I just recently heard about Gift, G-Y-F-T, which I understand you can potentially um, buy gift cards anonymously using Bitcoins you already have. Uh, to, to purchase things uh, in all kinds of different locations. So uh, these kinds of services, I'll say, but also technologies like the Lamassu machine really are the things that excite me because the more of those that there are out there, the more people will be using Bitcoin, the fewer people will be using these expensive, horrible systems uh, supported by governments and uh, big business, and uh, we'll get more competition and better a better world for everyone. So that's what excites me. Great. Jaffa. Uh Well, one of the uh, biggest obstacles right now to Bitcoin adoption is that it is pretty difficult to securely run Bitcoin. Uh, there, there are certainly ways to do it, but if you take your average user and say, here's some Bitcoin, store them on your computer or somewhere safe, they're, they're going to either screw that up or they're going to have to spend a lot of time learning how to, how to do that. Um, and that's not really, it's not because, you know, they, they don't know. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a skill that doesn't just, not everybody has. Um, so the technology that I see really shaping Bitcoin's future is um, what's called a hardware wallet. And they have one out now. Um, well, they, there's a couple, the, but the, uh, the latest one is, I think it's called Trezor. Is that, am I saying that right, Trezor? And what, what's really cool about Trezor is that it, it's not only is it a, a separate piece of hardware, but when, it actually, when you actually plug it into your computer and, um, and make a Bitcoin transaction, you are still not exposing, even if your computer is compromised, you are still not exposing yourself to, uh, to theft at that point. And so it's, it's, it's really something that anybody can use. Um, anybody who knows how to use like a thumb drive would be able to use this in theory. So I'm pretty excited for that. I think they've just uh, started taking pre-orders. This company, Trezor, they're based I think in the Czech Republic. And they've just started taking pre-orders, but they're expecting to ship in uh, November 2013, I think. So, mm -hmm. yeah, pre-orders can be a problem in the Bitcoin world. And do they order, do they accept Bitcoin? Of course. Well, they only accept Bitcoin. Yep. In fact, they're, the device is actually priced in Bitcoin, at least for okay. the time being. <laughs> good, they good. might change that price in the future. So, yeah. It's one Bitcoin so, for, a, for a thumb drive. Yeah, I, I wanted to reiterate your point that pre-orders have been an issue in the Bitcoin community, so yeah. uh, when you send Bitcoin, Buyer beware. when you send Bitcoin and it gets confirmed, there's practically no way to ever undo that. Um, 
I personally bought coffee once and I accidentally paid twice, you know, coffee coming in the mail. I paid twice, like I clicked the button twice. And so I emailed the person I bought coffee from and said, hey, I paid twice, and if you sent it back, I would be happy customer. And he certainly did. So um, it's just if you're dealing with trustworthy uh, businesses, I think you're very safe. But you know, if you're not, you're not that safe. But, yeah, just be careful. Um, so uh, there's any more technologies that can be built upon this? I mean, uh, Josh, weren't you mentioning how there was a, um, I mean, uh, outside of this thing, you mentioned how there was a, a new technology that allowed you to verify that a certain code had been run on a computer and that the output has been right? Yeah, there's, uh, well, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is uh, it's it's applied mathematics, I think, and that's that's a field uh, that yes. Yes, uh, yes. definitely talks to you. But um, it's 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 one of the real um, applications where you're using hardcore math uh, for very very practical use, uh, which is just sending money around. And um, so some of the things we're seeing now are these um, um, university departments coming out with these advanced mathematics that directly, and then they're saying, hey, this would be great for Bitcoin. Um, and one of those guys is a, a guy named uh, Eli Ben Sasson from uh, the Technion University in Israel. And he's coming up with this system that um, apparently allows you to do something incredible, which is running code. Uh, somebody else can run code on their computer and um, with inputs on their computer that you can't even see, but you can guarantee that they Run, ran the correct code on their computer, and that opens up all kinds of interesting opportunities for Bitcoin um, that we've yet to see. But things like really anonymizing Bitcoin transactions, because the way it is now, Bitcoin isn't really that anonymous. It's it is possible to do uh, analysis on the blockchain, which is public, and figure a lot of stuff out. Especially if you can get records from different companies like exchanges, you can figure out a lot about what's going on in the network. Um, this kind of new technology, there's other technology being developed by uh, Johns Hopkins called ZeroCoin. Um, these are anonymizing technologies uh, which would really robustly anonymize your Bitcoins in a mathematical way that, that um, can't be um, reconstructed. So there, there's a lot of uh, very exciting stuff in the uh, anonymity world, but these things could also address problems like the scalability problem we've been talking about the maximum size of the blockchain, if we can shrink um, how much room these transactions take in the blockchain, then we won't even have this dilemma of, you know, is this blockchain getting too big? We could just put a lot more transactions on it because we'd be so much more efficient. So a lot of exciting stuff coming out of very, very um, advanced mathematics being applied to Bitcoin. And I think that's going to be really ex interesting uh, phenomenon going forward in the next couple of years. Well, well, great. So I'd like to open the floor now uh, to questions. Uh, maybe something piqued your interest and you have a, a question you'd like to ask. And I believe there's a microphone set up here. So um, can people just come up to the front and, and you'll have to move that. But please, please, Pam. Oh. Justin, Justin, can you turn the mic on? This is going to show my ignorance, but could you explain mining? Josh. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, um, mining is kind of a big subject. What, what part of the mining are, are you interested in? I, I assume just like the, the general concept. When you use it as in investments or something? Um, well, mining itself is, is just obtain, creating Bitcoins. So every 10 minutes, there are 25 new Bitcoins that are coming to, into the system. The people who get those Bitcoins are the miners. And what the miners do is they are the transaction processors of the Bitcoin world. So they're going and they're processing all these transactions, verifying all the transactions, making sure they're good and publishing them on this distributed ledger. And in return, um, they get rewarded right now every 10 minutes with uh, 25 Bitcoins. That changes over time. But uh, for the current four-year period, it's 25 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. So someone would have to be really uh, technologically savvy to do something like that? Uh, actually not. So um, people often describe it as a very difficult mathematical problem, but you don't have to know any math in order to solve it because it's your computer doing it. So right now, for instance, there's this little USB device, which is just like a flash drive 
which you you know put in your pocket and uh, to copy files over. But instead, it's a Bitcoin miner. You just plug it in your computer, push a button, and you'll be a miner. Uh, this is really opening up so that it's accessible to everybody. You don't have to be um, really good with computers or anything. Thank you. I believe we have a few more questions. Andrew, go ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, quantum computing and eventually being able to break the Bitcoin? Uh, and then what are your thoughts on can we outrun it just by adding a few more digits to the encryption or whatever? Will encryption always be above decryption and so on and so on? <laughs> okay. So do you want that? Sure. Uh, okay. I, uh, I've been thinking about that as well. Uh, it's, I'll just, you know, I'll, let's just assume that there will eventually, maybe not with quantum computing, but there'll be something that breaks the uh, Bitcoin protocol in some way. And um, perhaps that's quantum computing. I, I think what um, the most likely scenario is that what we're going to see is a, uh, it won't be like a, a sudden boom, all of a sudden Bitcoin is worth zero. Uh, I think it'll be a more like a uh, a gradual onset of well here's you know here's where quantum computing is here's what it can do and as a result we're going to uh, as individuals decide well okay is Bitcoin going to hold up or do we need something better uh, there there that could be a potential scenario for a fork where we could just say um, okay we're going to switch the Bitcoin protocol to use something better that that the um, quantum computing would won't be able to break into. Uh, I'm kind of saying this in simple, like as simple terms as I can use, I guess. But essentially, I don't think it's going to be the, the important thing. Is I don't think it's going to be a, like a, a overnight thing. It's gonna we're gonna have time to react to that change. And if I could add to that, um, the Bitcoin protocol uses at least two cryptographic tools, maybe three. Is it at least two? And um, if one of them is susceptible to quantum computers. I mean, there's algorithms that already exist, I believe. Um, but the other is not. And um, the, the, the issue is when you send Bitcoins to an address and um, if you never spend them there, uh, the information is not publicly available to, um, to use a quantum computer to uh, steal those Bitcoins. But if you use a, an address, like if you have Bitcoin sent and then you send them and then from that address and then you have them sent to the same address, uh, then those Bitcoins would be susceptible to being st stolen using quantum computer. Um, I'm not fully up to date on the technology, but I believe uh, a quantum computer effective against uh, this, the, the main cryptography thing that I was mentioning that quantum computers can attack. Um, is still off, is still out, and there's some problems with the cu current quantum computers that are being commercially available, or are commercially available. That's what, I, that's what I've been told. So I still have to research it myself. Yes? Yeah, well, if there's, as if there's ever a problem with quantum computers, then there's always quantum cryptography, so keep well, the yes. fight up. Yeah. Uh, this question is for Teresa. Are there any active efforts to recruit uh, nonprofits, uh, particularly really well-known ones, for you know to accept Bitcoin, since this could be so useful for getting projects all around the world instantly, securely, all that. Yeah, that, that really excites me as well. Oh, sorry, this wasn't on. That excites me as well. Uh, we would love it to encourage other nonprofits to join us, and that's one of the reasons uh, Free Aid participated in a talk at the Bitcoin uh, conference uh, last month. <laughs> and uh, while we were at the Bitcoin conference, we met uh, someone, uh, Dimitri, from Bitcoin 100, which is a group uh, that's on the Bitcoin forums that is uh, actively seeking out nonprofits that will accept Bitcoins and uh, trying to talk them into it and uh, rewarding them with $1,000 with a Bitcoin uh, upon you know confirming and having their group agree that they're a cause worthy of supporting. And I'm very happy to say that they decided to support even though we don't have an IRS letter, so I I like them very much. <laughs> they don't they don't uh, they didn't take uh, IRS's word um, as as the be all end all, which I appreciate. That, but they did check us out thoroughly. They did uh, their diligence for sure. Yes, and uh, thank you, Ron. Um, Bitcoin not bombs is also. Uh, 
Drew and Davi, um, Drew's who's here, uh, are running an organization called Bitcoin Not Bombs to really support nonprofits that have, you know, to launch them into using Bitcoins. And, uh, and I'm not sure, maybe Drew could say, <laughs> I'm not sure if they're really trying to target big nonprofits as much as really supporting nonprofits that they like and want to support and uh, encourage in using Bitcoin. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, I was curious as to if, and this is a question for anyone, if you know if any outreach has been made to the ACLU or the Institute for Justice, or if anyone has any idea if Bitcoin is even on their radar, because I think Jaffet made the comment that they can't just outlaw Bitcoin, but I disagree. I absolutely think the powers that be are going to try, and they'll take someone sooner or later and destroy their life to try to scare at least Americans away from using Bitcoin. So they'll... They'll use, you know, just like Liberty Dollar was quashed, they'll, um, they'll call it counterfeiting or something like that. So they will arrest someone and um, suck up all their assets. So I'm just curious, has anyone in the Bitcoin community been planning for that or got a, you know, plan of defense, anything like that? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer that first. One, one thing that's very different about Bitcoin from Liberty Dollars and many other uh, you know, I think e-gold was another one. Things that are, it's very different because Bitcoin is decentralized. All those miners that Josh was talking about, those are all where Bitcoin is. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't really destroy Bitcoin without destroying the internet. So, um, you know, that certainly is, I guess, a possibility, but um, I, I think it would be very unlikely. And, uh, and so I, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm kind of, curious to see what they will do. I think it would be very, very difficult for them to take it down. But like Jaffet was saying, um, I think the way that they would try to do it would be to uh, make it very difficult for people that are publicly accepting Bitcoins in their business and people that are already connected to the leg legacy banking system as well as Bitcoin. So, um, and that would be bad, you know. Uh, th when they went after Mt. Gox's Dwala account, it was just their Dwala account in the U.S., but it still, you know, it created quite a big stir among Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, they'll probably try to do more things like that over time. Uh, there is the uh, EFF, uh, Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, I think. Um, and they've recently been started accepting Bitcoin donations. So they, it's definitely on their radar, and they, they fight a lot of this stuff. Uh, I think that's going to be a really good ally. Uh, and uh, your question was about the ACLU, and I, I guess, I guess the idea being that we needed somebody fighting for our cause, fighting for the the cause of um, freedom and money, and that that's a definitely worthy cause. I I see that as being po one possible way to further further that cause, uh, but the other way, I think the. Um, a very important thing to do is, is spreading the word on Bitcoin, getting as many merchants as possible using it right now before the government can um, make, it a, a, make it look like something evil, like, like this is something we need to crack down on. Um, I mean, if they tried to do that right now, if they, if they came down full force and let's say uh, went after all these Bitcoin merchants right now, and tried to squash it that way, that, that would be very effective right now because it is such a small, it is, it is such a, a new thing that the vast majority of people are going to be like, what's this Bitcoin thing? Oh, something I've never used. It's not, it sounds fishy. And there's not a lot of awareness of it. Whereas if we um, can get it into the hands of a lot more people, then it's going to be a lot harder for them to justify um, and at a philosophical level. Well, very last question. Okay, thanks. Um, so obviously, Bitcoin currently has a very tiny percentage of the world economy. Um, in terms of the amount transacted through it, um, looking into the future in, in you know, envisioning a world in which you know a substantial portion of the world economy was transacted in Bitcoin, um, what hurdles or new technologies do you see as being necessary for that? I mean, obviously there's the education component, but I mean I've talked to a lot of people that uh, like just say, oh, you know, I just don't understand Bitcoin. I mean, do you think that's something that will just naturally, you know? As p more people get accepted, you know, they won't have to worry about it. I mean, there's the things like the hardware wallet, uh, things like that. But do you see any other technological developments that would be necessary um, besides just education for Bitcoin to be, you know, a substantial portion of the world economy? Yeah, I think uh, this, we definitely need better um, software apps, better, you know, the hardware wallet is a huge part of it. Um, 
just uh, better apps for your for your uh, smartphone or your iPhone. Um, and that's not really the case. You need to have a better, much better experience for um, in-person Bitcoin transactions. Right now, it can take hours uh, sometimes for the transaction to clear because there are different ways that these apps handle those transactions. So a lot of seemingly small details to just make the whole process smoother will have a huge effect on the ability of the average person to be able to use Bitcoin. But these aren't huge technological, advanced mathematical uh, problems. It's just getting the user interface better, you know. It sounds like you're mentioning er something uh, akin to ergonomic design or, or something like that. Yeah, right. So Making it's not sure really it right. you know, phys physical ergonomic yeah. design, but yeah, yeah. a user interface that takes the, the average uh, user into. And, and that usually happens when um, the technology matures a bit from, you know, the first hackers and then all these other people who are um, really good at design and really good at humor, human interface design uh, start getting into it and, and building these things and saying, hey, ha let's take a look at how these transactions actually happen and, and um, how are the users experiencing these things and how can we make this better and we have to really pay attention to make sure that transaction happens fast and that there aren't any of these edge cases where these transactions take hours to uh, go over the network even though that shouldn't happen but there are cases where it does. So, so fixing all those details and, and getting it to be a really smooth uh, experience and uh, stuff like the hardware wallet where you just plug it in, you have a safe wallet. You don't have to be a, you know, a network security expert to, to, to install a Bitcoin wallet on your computer. Um, Bitcoin debit cards where you just have something that's like a credit card, but it, works, it doesn't work with any banks. It's just you put your uh, card on the counter and you can make your transaction. Um, all kinds of stuff like that, which is just a matter of somebody sitting down, developing the product and, and putting it out. And I think we'll see that. You know, in the next couple of years. Well, great. Thank you, Josh. That's all the time we have for this discussion, but I believe most of us will be around all uh, pork fest. I'm, I'm not sure. Everybody is going to be around. I'll be around, and um, you'll probably be around the Bitcoin ATM yeah. up, up there near Revolution Coffee. Revolution Coffee, yeah. yeah. Come by and get rid of your uh, and then, fiat. And you may have seen the free aid tent right when you come in the, uh, the, the main Rogers campground. And uh, so we'll be here around, and so uh, if you see us, uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions. We like to talk about Bitcoin, so. <laughs> Thank you.